Jimmy, dear friends. Happy New Year, including for the little one. And uh, let's turn to Genesis. These beautiful songs remind us also of Abram, Abram, the father of all believers. And the lessons Abram had to learn, we need to learn, because we are, Abram is our father in the faith. The last time we uh, looked at Genesis 12 and 13, uh, beginning of 13, I'll read tonight uh, chapter 13 from verse 14 and a couple of verses in chapter 14. So Genesis 13, starting at verse 14. And Jehovah said to Abram, after that Lot had separated himself from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that thou seest will I give to thee and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if any one can number the dust of the earth, thy seed also will be numbered. Arise, walk through the land according to the length of it and according to the breadth of it, for I will give it to thee. Then Abram moved his tents and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And he built there an altar to the Lord. So just a few thoughts about this, and then we go on in chapter 14. Abram is the father of all believers. And we have seen the last time when God called Abram, he was involved in idolatry. He was an idol worshiper. And God delivered him from the power of the idols. And actually, behind the power of the idols is the power of Satan. And he set him free. And not only that, God uh, wanted to have Abram as a witness for himself. See, after the flood, in Genesis 10 and 11, we read how the descendants of Noah fell into idolatry. And it climaxed even in Babylon, is the building of the city of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And then God dispersed them over the face of the earth. But then God let the nations go in their own way, as we have also uh, in Acts 14, a comment by Paul about that. And we see then how God called Abram. So God, God called him as a powerful voice to leave these idols. Now when we talk about this, we also need to remind ourselves of what God has done in our lives. God has called us to set us free from the power of this world, from the power of Satan, from the power of idolatry because idolatry is everything that replaces the true God. So we have all kinds of idols that we can be under, under control of. And so God has set us free when he called us. And last time we have also compared this with the call of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was a fanatic Jew, but he was not better than those idol worshippers. And so we have seen how this call also was realized in Saul of Tarsus calling. And then he made the connection with us today. God has called us. He's still calling people, you know, everywhere where they are. He's calling them to be saved and to follow the Lord Jesus. And so we have, by the grace of God, become followers of the Lord Jesus. Like Saul of Tarsus became a follower of the Lord Jesus. So we have become followers of the Lord Jesus. And I've mentioned an example also in the history of John Darby who learned a lot of lessons from the scriptures. And we'll see a few more things about that when we come to Genesis 14. So we have a lot of examples that we can follow. We learn from Abram, the father of all believers. We learn from Paul. Paul is an example for us today. He was called by the Lord in the glory. He knew, he got to know the Lord even better than Abram did. And then we see how this applies to us today. God has called us to have us for himself, to enjoy fellowship with us. And we'll see a little bit about that in Genesis 13. So what happened in Genesis 12, after God called Abram, he separated him from his family, from his country, and from the idolatry he was involved in. 
and God had seven promises for Abram. It's interesting that uh, we have seven occasions in Genesis that God revealed himself to Abram. Here in Genesis 12 is the first one. The second one we saw also last time in Genesis 12 verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram. So that was a special revelation. And so we have seven revelations by God to Abram. This was the second one. And here we see then how uh, Abram continued to call the, the calling, but we have seen there was a deviation. Abram went to Egypt. And that's not to talk about our brothers who came from Egypt in a negative way, not at all. The point is, Egypt stands for this world independent of God. So Abram acted here in independency. He didn't ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to go to Egypt? He just went. That is independent action. And that can happen to all of us. We can act in independency instead of asking the Lord what to do. We act in independency. And that had uh, serious consequences. But by the grace of God, Abram was restored. God brought him back to the place, the the second altar that he had built. And in verse 4 of chapter 13, he came back to the place of the altar that he had made there at the first. So God wants Restoration. God's the God of restoration. If we have deviated, we can always trust God that he wants to bring us back. And then we have this problem is Lot. Lot was so influenced by uh, what he saw in Egypt and had become rich. Abraham had become rich and there was a quarrel between the shepherds, uh, as you find in chapter 13. And then uh, Abraham gave the chance to Lot to make the choice first. And in verse 10, we see that Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the Jordan that it was thoroughly watered before Jehovah had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah as the garden of Jehovah, like the land of Egypt. See, Lot in his thinking had been influenced by Egypt. And so Lot chose then for himself the plain, verse 11, of the Jordan. So Lot was very selfish. He should have given the first choice to Abram, his uncle, but he didn't. And so that's another lesson for us, not to act in a selfish way, and the, and that caused separation between Lot and Abram. And so what Lot did then, he went to the cities of the plain and pitched his tents as far as Sodom, verse 12. And so there is a downward trend in Lot's uh, development, where And then in verse 13 it says, The people of Sodom were wicked and great sinners before the Lord. Then, in contrast to that, we see Abram in verse 14. The Lord spoke to Abram after that Lot had separated himself from him. Lift up now your eyes. So instead of lifting up his eyes as Lot did, to look at the things from a a worldly perspective, a selfish perspective, perspective, he lifted up his eyes according to God's thoughts. What did God say? Look from the place where you are northward, southward, eastward, westward. It's the sign of the cross, like this. And that's how in the the ancient days they signed the cross. Anyway, this is connected with the whole country that was before Abraham And he says, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your seed forever. And God promised in verse 16, I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, thy seed also will be numbered. Later on in Genesis 15, maybe the next time we will see that, God compares the descendants that he will give to Abram with the stars of heaven. Here he compares it with the dust of the earth that you cannot number. That's the point. And so God is talking here about Abram's descendants. You know when this prophecy will be fulfilled? In the millennium to come. So that God has a a long-term plan. In the meantime, God wants Abram to enter into these things, into these promises. And that's why he says in verse 17, Arise. Walk through the land according to the length of it and according to the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. So this is God's promise for Abraham to give him this land 
And as I said earlier, this will ultimately be fulfilled in the world to come, in the millennium. Before that, Israel possessed the land, but not in its width, as we find here. And I want to make an application now for us. I mentioned Saul of Tarsus the last time, and also tonight. Saul is really an example for us. He became the Apostle Paul, and he entered into the heavenly land. He rose and walked through the land in this in the heavenly sphere. So he had seen the Lord in the glory, and he became familiar with God's plans right now for the people of God right now. We are on this earth, but we are connected with heaven. We are connected with the Lord Jesus at God's right hand. That's our privilege. And the Lord Jesus at God's right hand, he is right there in the heavenly land. So what we have here, this earthly land, the promised land, is really an illustration of what we have today. For Israel, this is still future. But for us, this is a reality, that we may enter that land through faith, through the action of the Holy Spirit, and see the Lord Jesus crowned with glory and honor. And he invites us to enter into these things. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. We see in Colossians the greatness of the Lord Jesus there at God's right hand. And God says, I invite you to go through the land in its breadth, in its width. And you know, when you turn to Ephesians 3, you find four dimensions. Here, Abram, you have two dimensions. But the heavenly land is this played to us in four dimensions. If you go to Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, you find these four dimensions. So the Lord Jesus is now at God's right hand, and he has given a special ministry to the Apostle Paul to speak about the greatness of the Lord Jesus, to speak about the tremendous blessings that we have in Christ, in heavenly places, in the heavenlies. And so what Paul says, he speaks about this uh, eternal purpose that God had. God wanted to give us that heavenly land. That's our promised land. And he says in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 5, that these things have not been made known in previous generations, but now have been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. That means it was revealed to Paul, but Paul was able to share that with the apostles in those days and he includes them and together with the prophets the other uh, writers of the New Testament they have laid the foundation God has revealed these wonderful things to them and they have communicated through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit communicate that to us even today and so these things have a tremendous value for us today as well because we are now connected with uh, Christ as joint heirs we are co-heirs the Lord Jesus is the great heir. God appointed him, established him, Hebrews 1, 2, as heir, even before the creation. God had in mind to bring many sons to glory. And so God appointed the Lord Jesus as heir already before the creation started. And he wants to share all these things with us. Not only the literal creation, but also these spiritual blessings that we have here in Ephesians 3. That is God's eternal purpose in Christ Jesus. That is verse 6. And then we see that Paul became a minister. Literally the word deacon is used in verse 7. And that God gave grace to him, to Paul, according to the working of his power. So God is here at work in his power. Just as God called Abram in his power, and Abram was then led to the promised land literally here on this earth, so God called Saul of Tarsus and introduced him into these wonderful things. You can read in Galatians 1 more details about this. But Paul speaks about this ministry that the Lord Jesus in heaven gave to him. He called him for that purpose. And it was according to God's grace and also according to the working of his power. God's power was at work in this calling of Paul. God's power is at work also in giving us this wonderful inheritance. And then in verse 8 he says to me, less than the least of all saints. So Paul puts himself on a, a low basis. He doesn't put himself on a pedestal. He puts himself very low and humble. And so God 
has given me this grace to announce among the nations the glad tidings of the unsearchable riches of the Christ. So this heavenly land, you can sum it up in a few words. The unsearchable riches of the Christ. Christ is the anointed one. God has anointed the Lord Jesus in heaven. And the unsearchable riches connected with his wonderful person were revealed to Paul and through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit also revealed to us so that we would enter into these things. And he says in verse 9, and to enlighten all with the knowledge of what is the administration of the mystery hidden throughout the ages in God who has created all things. So this is God's plan to bring many sons to glory to make us co-heirs that we that the Lord Jesus can share with us these wonderful things. And God wants us to enter in these things already now. Why? So that we can be worshippers. So that already now we can be worshippers. And that's what you have in the rest of chapter 3. This land in its width and its breadth and its depth is presented here. So he speaks in verse 10 about the all various wisdom of God. Verse 11, according to the purpose of the ages or the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, in whom we have, that's a precious expression, in whom we have boldness and access. So through the Lord Jesus we can enter into these things. As Abram was called to rise up and walk through the land, God says now to us, rise up and walk through this land. Get familiar with these things. See what your inheritance is. And... That is why Paul starts to pray in verse 13. Wherefore, I beseech you not to faint through my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or to the Father. He speaks it to the Eternal Father of the Eternal Son. Verse 15, of whom every family in the heavens and on earth is named in order that he may give you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man that the Christ may dwell through faith in your hearts being rooted and founded in love in order that you may be fully able to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth you see it? the breadth and the length but then he goes on and depth and height so we have even more dimensions than Abram had and here in verse, four, verse uh, 19, and to know. So God wants us to enter into these things so that he may have fellowship with us, that we may enjoy these riches and blessings. The love of the Christ which surpasses knowledge. That he may be filled even to all the fullness of God. So God brings us into these wonderful things and at the same time he brings those wonderful things through the Holy Spirit in us. It's not a contradiction to go together that you may be filled even to all the fullness of God. So this, this fullness of God is like an ocean, and God says, get into that ocean. At the same time, that ocean comes into us, and that takes all the believers together who enter in these wonderful treasures, in these wonderful blessings. And that results in a response to him, verse 20, who is able to do far exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power which works in us, to him be glory in the assembly by Christ Jesus and to all generations of the age of ages. Amen. That's Paul's prayer. And that goes together with the heavenly land. So there is a parallel between Abraham and Paul, but there's also a difference because what we have now in connection with the Lord Jesus as he's now in heaven goes further than Abraham ever understood. And to make the link with John Darby, by the grace of God, God used him as an instrument so that the believers could be brought back to these wonderful things. These wonderful things had been lost in the history of the church. And so God used that brother to reopen that door, as it were. Nothing new. He went back to what God had given to Paul and in the New Testament. There's no man invention. It is going back to what God had given in the beginning. And that's the same challenge for us today. And so when we go back now to Genesis 13, what do we see there in verse 18? Genesis 13, verse 18. Abram moved his tents. So Abram 
had become a pilgrim. He was traveling through the land as a stranger, as a pilgrim, on his way to the future land, as that is still future. He was a pilgrim. But also, he was um, living in tents, so that means he was a stranger. And not only that, he was an overcomer. That's a New Testament term, but that speaks about a believer who enters into God's thoughts despite the resistance, be, 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 despite the obstacles, despite the difficulties. Abram was left, uh, his nephew had left him, and yet Abram was not discouraged. He went on, and he moved his stance, and he did exactly what God wants him to do. And he came then to dwell by the oaks of Mamre. Mamre is this place that God, uh, the special place in the promised land, close to Hebron. Hebron speaks of fellowship, so Abram enjoyed fellowship with God. Mamre speaks of the blessings of the land, and this is a wonderful portion that Abram had at that time. But this speaks, it's like a type of what we have today in Christ. And as I tried to explain earlier, what we have in Christ now supersedes what Abram enjoyed in fellowship with God. But that verse ends with a very beautiful note. He built there an altar to Jehovah. So this is the third altar that Abram built. When he entered the land, the Lord appeared to Abram. I mentioned that earlier in Genesis 12, verse 7, because the Canaanites were there. Abram had left idolatry, and now he came to a land there it was even worse idolatry. And so God appeared to him, and Abram responded to that in 12, 7, and he built an altar. That altar is really a place of sacrifice, but the altar is then also the place to meet God and to express fellowship with God, to give a response to God. And he had then another altar, the second altar in verse 8, that is a further development. So uh, Abram was making progress. And here we see a third altar. So Abram kept growing. And our hymns were reminded of that also, that we need to keep trusting. That's what Abram did. And he also kept growing. If we say, now we know it all, and we, we say, oh, forget about the rest. No. God wants us, to, wants us to enter into these things and keep going so that we have this fellowship with him, that we see more of his greatness. And so we follow Abram's example in this matter also, to be worshippers. Abram became a worshipper. The altar is a place of intercession, but also of access. We read in Ephesians 3, we have this free access. That's what Abram had. But my point was, we have our access is even greater than the access that Abram had. So, when you come to chapter 14 now, we'll look at chapter 14 briefly, because there we come to another development in connection with Melchizedek. The beginning of chapter 14, we have the first war described in the scriptures. It's a war between the people who came from uh, the area where Abram used to live in Mesopotamia. They came from that area, and they were very powerful kings. And those kings were so powerful that they even submitted the Rephaim. Rephaim are the giants that were still there. Not giants from before the flood, but giants that uh, grew up after the flood. And they were servants of the, uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what this, these kings did, they first attacked those servants, although they were giants, and they, uh, they attacked them. And then, after they smote them in verse 5, they went on to attack the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, verse 7, you have also the Amalekites, but that is later, that, that is a later development, but the country of the Amalekites is mentioned there already. And then we have the king of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 8. And then the tragedy. What happened? Verse 12. They took Lot and his property. See, Lot had become a friend of this world. Abram was a friend of God. And Abram was a worshiper. But Lot had become a friend of this world. And that had consequences. Now, Lot was taken by these attacking kings. 
and all that he had. That's a tragedy. You would hope that Lot learned from this, but later on he went back, and later we see that he even was in the gate of Sodom. That means he was in the municipality there. He had not learned his lesson yet. Uh, all these kings who were here uh, delivered by Abram, as we see now in the second part of the chapter, they perished also in the destruction of Sodom, as we find in Genesis 19. But then the second part of Genesis 14 is very interesting. We see that uh, Abram was there. Abram is a friend of God. We saw that last time in, Luke, in uh, uh, James chapter 2. Abram is a friend of God. Literally means lover of God. But that doesn't mean that Abram had no uh, interest in his nephew because Abram was a lover of God and he could say, well, Abram, uh, Lot became a friend of this world, so who cares? No. Abram felt responsible, responsibility for his uh, relative. And so what we read down in verse 13, one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. Abram the Hebrew is an interesting expression that refers to the fact that Abram was a stranger in this land. He came from the other side. But he had still an influence on the people in that land. It says in verse 13, he dwelt by the oaks of Mamre. We saw that at the end of chapter 13. And he was there with the Amorite, the brother of Ashkol, and the brother of Aner. And these were Abram's allies. So that means uh, they trusted Abram and they respected Abram. And Abram respected them. Doesn't mean that they became believers. Later on, they also perished in the destruction of Sodom, as you have in Genesis uh, 19. But for now, they were with Abram, and Abram, uh, they helped each other. So that is not wrong. And in verse 14, Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, and he let out his trained servants. So not only, as we see later, that uh, these, uh, these uh, allies would help Abram, he had in his own house trained servants. That is very interesting. The word trained is the same root as you have in the word Enoch. Enoch means um, instructed or it can also mean uh, dedicated. Enoch was dedicated to the Lord. He walked with the Lord and God instructed him. And here we have strange servants who Abram instructed. So they uh, were born in his house. It's beautiful illustration of the believers today, how we may be trained in the school of God and may be servants. Anyway, that's an application. But notice here how Abram had a great influence. Abram had a great impact on these people. And this is an illustration, an encouragement for us to have a positive impact on those around us. And they had been trained by, by Abram. And what happened? He called them, and together they pursued those four mighty kings, even up to Dan. In verse 15, he divided himself against them by night. So Abram was really in control, but he divided the, the group in three. That tactic is sometimes done by others as well. You find in other examples of the, the scriptures, so in, in um, Gideon, for example. And he pursued them up north to Hobah. That's very far, far away, left to Damascus. So what an action was this? And then notice in verse 16, he brought back all the property. So this is uh, the rescue, this is restoration. God had allowed these people to survive. They were not killed, they were just taken. And Abram was now able to rescue them from the hold of these kings. And verse 16, he brought back all the property. So these persons were rescued. The property was brought back. <coughs> Again, his brother Lot and his property. So that's amazing. We have mentioned earlier Abram as an overcomer. In many ways, we have another example of Abram as an overcomer. He overcame the power of these kings and rescued uh, the people who were taken by them and brought them all back. It's a beautiful illustration of how the Lord is also the one who brings people back. If we have gone astray, I'll just make an application. The Lord is able to bring us back. 
but we have to let him work. Abraham had a heart for these people and he brought them back. And then in verse 17, there is a great uh, temptation for Abraham coming up. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after he had returned from smiting Kidor Laomer and the kings that were with him into the valley of Save, which is the king's valley. This was a great temptation, but God intervened. We'll see that with the, uh, Melchizedek. So he was returning, and they met in the valley of Shave. The valley is a place, it's lower, of course, than the mountains, but in that valley is where they met. And it's called the king's valley. That is what behoves to a king, to be humble. A valley speaks of humility. We see the Lord when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey, humble, in humility. Later, in, uh, with Absalom, he put in this valley a statue for himself. That's the opposite. Outwardly, it's a place of humility, the valley, but Absalom was a very proud man. So that's also possible in Christianity. You may have people who are truly humble, like Paul, the lowest of all saints, Ephesians 3, we've read it tonight. And he is in the king's valley. But there are also people who feign, who give a show of humility, as Paul explains in Colossians 2. They are also in this valley. And now what happens in that valley is going to meet the king of Sodom. But there is where God comes in. He, God intervenes. He brings out Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Who is that? So I want to read a bit later from Psalm 110 and also from Hebrews to see the greatness of this king. Some believe that Melchizedek was Seth, the son of Noah, who is still uh, alive at that time. I don't know. God knows. But what the scriptures, we'll see that in Hebrews, he is not mentioned as having a father or a mother. There is no genealogy given. That is to make him a type of the Lord Jesus. But we'll see that in Hebrews in a moment. But now this verse 18. At that moment that the king of Sodom was ready to meet Abram, God allowed Melchizedek to be the first to meet Abram and to greet him. And what do we see? Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. So Melchizedek is the king of Salem. Salem means peace. And he brings out bread and wine, sign of fellowship. And it says he was priest of the Most High God. And I just want to pause here a little bit. The Most High God. Lord willing, the next time we'll see in chapter 17, I want to go from 5, 15 to 17, that we see God as the Almighty. He can give Abram a seed. Abram was too old to generate a son. Sarah was too old to conceive. She was sterile. And God is going to give a son to that couple. We see that in chapter 15 to 17, the next time, Lord willing. That's connected with the Almighty. But the Almighty is also the most high God. If you want to make a note for that, the Almighty will, we hope to speak more about that the next time. In Psalm 139, you see God is the omniscient. God is the omnipotent. That's almighty. And he's the omnipresent. Psalm 139 is really helpful to read that in that connection. So this most high God is also the most powerful God, the almighty. But here at this moment, Abraham first meets the most high God. You find in Psalm 91 that who dwells in the abode of the uh, Most High uh, and the Almighty will also dwell in the uh, presence of the... Uh, I forgot now how it runs. But that is a beautiful verse. Psalm 91 is a wonderful passage that speaks about the privilege that we have to uh, enjoy the fellowship with the Most High and then we will also abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So my point is, we sang tonight that we need to trust. That's what Abram did. Abram learned to trust God, and so he got to know the Most High. And in chapter 17, we'll see he, he, he meets the Almighty. And this is how God wants to teach us also, 
to have this trust in God, the Most High, and then also to rely on God, who is the Almighty. He will fulfill his promises. And so we can trust him. Now go back to Genesis 14 uh, uh, for a moment. When Abram meets uh, the most, uh, the, 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 the um, Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a king, king of Salem, but he was also a priest. Later in Israel, it was forbidden that the priest would be king or the king would be priest. Only that is reserved to the Lord. Now, if you turn to uh, Psalm 110, you see that the Lord is both. In Psalm 110, we read, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies as footstool of thy feet. So here, the Lord speaks, Jehovah speaks to my Lord. My Lord is Adoni. That means David has a relationship with Adoni, that is his son. The descendant, Abram's descendant will be this uh, Lord. He will be uh, at the right hand, sit at my right hand. You know, when was that fulfilled? When the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven. Hebrews 1, he could ascend and sit down at God's right hand. That was fulfilled. In the meantime, he's waiting till God will put all his enemies at his footstool. That is still future. And in verse 4, Jehovah has sworn. So that is an oath. When God makes an oath, he will fulfill it. And he will not repent. He will not change his mind. What does he say? Thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So now, my Lord, that is David's descendant, Adoni, that is the Lord Jesus, is also this priest Thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so this is important for us to understand the greatness of the Lord Jesus. He is the true Melchizedek. He is the true Lord. He will be in charge of everything. He is the omnipotent. And he is now seen as this great priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's why I would like to link that with Hebrews. Uh, I mentioned earlier, there's a parallel between uh, Abraham and Paul and Paul explains in Hebrews uh, more about this Melchizedek so Abraham re- um, met literally the king called Melchizedek but Abraham, excuse me uh, Paul in Hebrews I suppose Paul is the author of Hebrews he uh, speaks of the greatness of the Lord Jesus from Hebrews 1 to Hebrews 13 it's a wonderful book that speaks of the greatness of the Lord Jesus and he says now in Hebrews 5 that he wanted, Paul wanted to explain in more detail to the believers how great this one is at God's right hand. In Hebrews 4, you see the Lord Jesus at God's right hand as the intercessor, as the one who supplies for our needs. But then Paul wants to go on to another picture. The Lord Jesus is also the one whom we may approach and may worship. And so he wants to present the Lord Jesus not only in connection with our needs, that he will supply for our needs, for chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. He wants now to speak about the Lord Jesus as the great Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. But in order to do that, the believers needed to be trained. They needed to grow. They needed to become perfected as verse 9 says and so that's also a lesson for us God wants us to enter into these things but that takes spiritual growth it takes progress in the school of God but God wants to communicate us to us the greatness of this Melchizedek and, but in order to receive it you need to grow first from milk to, uh, to solid food at the end of chapter 5 and then Paul explains in chapter 6 the way how you can get there. And then in chapter 7, he speaks again about this Melchizedek. He mentioned Melchizedek eight times in Hebrews. Melchizedek represents a new order of things. Eight stands for a new order of things. And this Melchizedek in chapter 7, verse 1, king of Salem. So there we have again Salem that we had in Genesis 14. Speaks about his dignity. He is king 
but he's also priest. You see that in Hebrews 7 verse 1? Priest of the Most High God. There it is. We saw God, the Most High, in Genesis 14. And here it's again. Priest of the Most High God. And so that also speaks about the Lord Jesus as the priest in the world to come of the Most High God. And Abraham met Melchizedek when he came back from this victory over those kings that we saw in Genesis 14. And then he speaks more in more detail about this king of Salem. We don't have those details in Genesis 14. What does Paul say here? What does the author here say? Hebrews 7, verse 3. Without father, without mother. It means it's not mentioned. Of course he had a father and a mother. But it's not mentioned in scripture. Why? So that he could be an example of the Lord Jesus. Look at this. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but assimilated to the Son of God. So God used this Melchizedek. Of course, he had a little father and a little mother, but it's not mentioned so that Melchizedek could be a type of the Son of God. The Son of God is the eternal Son. He doesn't have a father and mother in a natural sense as we speak of a father and mother. And so then he goes on to say in verse uh, uh, the following verse now consider how great this person person was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth out of the spoils so that's why I said earlier it's good that God allowed Abraham to meet Melchizedek first before he would meet the king of Sodom and so Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek why did he do that? to honor Melchizedek and Melchizedek was the priest of the most high God and Abraham wanted to honor him this king priest who is a type of the Lord Jesus we saw that in Psalm 110 and Abraham gave a response to this great king and I make an application for us today dear friends what Abraham had to learn we need to learn we need to give this uh, homage this honor to the Lord Jesus who is this great Melchizedek He is the great king of Salem. He is the great priest. And Hebrews uh, 7 goes on to explain that Abram's literal descendants were not involved in this. The Levites, the sons of Levi, they receive the priesthood. They take tithes according to the law and they give tithes. But he says in verse 6, but he who has no genealogy from them has tithed Abram. So that means Abram himself gave tithes to Melchizedek to honor Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek honored him. He blessed him who had the promises. So we see two blessings. Abram blessed Melchizedek and Melchizedek blessed Abram. And also what we see that uh, literally in uh, Genesis uh, 14 we see that he blessed him so Abram met this most priest of the most high God and this priest of the most high God Melchizedek blessed Abram and said blessed be Abram of the most high God so on behalf of the most high God Melchizedek blessed Abram and then in Genesis 14 we read in verse 20 and blessed be the most high God who has delivered thine enemies into thy hand so on behalf of Abram now Melchizedek blessed the most high God so that is this wonderful person of Melchizedek in between Abram and the most high God so Melchizedek is really a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus as he will be the king priest in the world to come but for us he is already this king priest in heaven at God's right hand, Psalm 110. Did you know that Psalm 110, sit at my right hand, is quoted seven times in Paul's writings and one more time in 1 Peter 3. It's a very important thought. There is now someone at God's right hand. That is this great person we talk about and Melchizedek speaks of him. So let's conclude in uh, Genesis 14 for now. After... Uh, Abram gave the tents of all to Melchizedek then he meets 
the king of Sodom. That's why I said earlier it was good that God allowed this to happen, that he would meet first Melchizedek, and after that he would meet the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom said to Abram in chapter 14, verse 21, Give me the souls, and you take the property for yourself. And then verse 22, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to Jehovah. So that means he realized his dependence of the Lord, who is the most high God. So Abram enjoys this revelation. And he testifies of that to the king of Sodom. And he says, he is the possessor of heaven and earth. I want to honor him. I don't want to receive anything from you. Verse 23. So there's like an oath also. I will not receive from you anything, not even a thread or a sandal thong. If anything of you. Why not? So that you can never say, I have made Abram rich. So Abram wanted to rely on the most high God. Abram wanted to honor this uh, king, Melchizedek, the priest of the most high God, He did not want to put the king of Sodom on a pedestal. And that's a lesson for us today. Also, we we see the greatness of God's plans. But you are surrounded by people like you, the king of Sodom. And so we need to honor people like Abram did with Ashkel and uh, the Amorite and and Mamre, uh, Aner. But we respect them. But we Above all, we want to serve the Lord Jesus, who is the great Melchizedek. We want to serve God, and we want to honor him. And we want to uh, to show that in our actions, in our words. And the chapter concludes with verse 24. And that, sees, that we see the reality of life. Abraham realizes that these helpers, these allies, have helped him. And so he says, what they have used, the food that they have used, and there's people, that you can give. So honor them, Abraham, Eshkel, and Mamre, Abraham's allies, give them their portion. So Abraham is realistic. They have done a lot for Abraham, and so he wants them to be rewarded. But Abraham did not want to receive anything from the king of Sodom, And so that is also for us. Lot wanted to make a deal with this world. He was an ally, a friend of this world. But Abram is a friend of God. And so he puts his trust in God. He does not put his trust in this world. And so may the Lord help us to enter into these things. And then the next time, Lord willing, we will see more about this connection between the Most High God and the Almighty. And I close with this thought. This is a a challenge also for us because Abram was not always on that level here he sees the things from a proper perspective but in chapter 15 we'll see that he was afraid because these mighty kings might come back those four kings that he had overcome they might come back and what happens then so Abram was concerned about what would happen next but that shows Abram needed to continue to put his trust in the most high God and for us We need to continue to put our trust, as we have said in the hymns also, in the Lord. Trust him all the time. Because we have a tendency, I mean, I have a tendency, we in general have a human tendency to put trust in ourselves or in people or in governments or whatever it is, instead of trusting the Lord. That's a challenge for us. And so Abram had to learn this, and we'll see that also in connection with the Almighty. Abram really had to learn to put his trust in him. And in that sense, we can learn from Abram. We can also learn from Abram's uh, failures. But the, the bottom line is that Abram put his trust in this great God. And this God is also our God, and he is our Father. And our relationship is even more intimate than Abram had with this great God. So may the Lord bless his word. And if there are questions or things that need to be clarified, uh, speak up or forever hold your peace. I'm not saying, I'm just joking, okay? I'm not a joker, but in this case, I joked. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's why it said has no, his father is not mentioned, his mother is not mentioned. So the point is not that he was a Gentile. The point is that he became the priest of the Most High God. How? We don't know. It's a mystery. And so we cannot explain everything, but the point is we need to see that he is a type of the Lord Jesus as the great Melchizedek, the priest, king of the Most High God. That's what we need to take. And that Abram honored him by giving him the tithes, and so that is the lesson that we draw from this, and that's why Psalm 10 goes alongside with this, and also Hebrews 5 to 7. The Lord Jesus is now at God's right hand. He's the great Melchizedek right now. And so we know him, that's for sure. We have a better understanding who the true Melchizedek is than the person in history past. We don't know who it was. Any other questions? So continue to read Genesis. It's a beautiful book, the book of the beginnings, and we have many lessons in it. May the Lord bless his word. Amen.